Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. Today, we're going to talk about this acceleration to the downside. I was sort of preparing for the show, eyeing the indexes really roll over in the last 30 minutes. Last 30 minutes of trading tell you a lot about what institutions are doing. If they've not been taking risk off the table, they certainly did it going into the close. An epic down day with the NASDAQ 100 down 4.5%. What does this mean for the big picture, ladies and gentlemen? This is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the technical toolkit. I'm often asked, when does technical analysis work better than other times? I would argue, of course, from a very biased perspective, having made my career looking at charts hours and hours every day, I think it's always helpful, but especially in times like this. Technical analysis is about identifying opportunities, about really three things, identifying opportunities, managing risk, and better understanding the world around us as investors. And I would encourage you to think about each of those three things. How are charts, how is the Stock Charts platform helping you identify new opportunities uh, to the upside if, if those exist in this environment? How do they help you manage risk? And I hope that you are learning the lessons of market history, but recognizing stocks that are breaking down, recognizing the signs of deterioration. We've been talking about the prospect of higher rates and what that impacts you know, some of the growth names that are struggling so mightily uh, this week and helping you understand the world around you. And, and I hope this show helps to make sense of things, helps to uh, you know allow you to take a step back and just reflect on the movements of these different markets and keep a proper uh, attention on the long-term trends. We have some great guests on the show. Uh, we only had one this week, Jeff Huge, but it was fantastic yesterday. So if you missed it, go to stockchartstv.com to check out his discussion because it was very, very interesting in terms, in, including an aggressive upside uh, projection for the 10-year yield. Next week, we have three solid guests. On Tuesday the 3rd, Jeff Weiss, who's the uh, technical analyst at Clearview Trading Advisors, one of my mentors, and I'm excited to get his uh, take on the, on the market environment. Wednesday the 4th, we have Katie Stockton, the founder of Fairlead Strategies and manager of the TAC ETF recently uh, released. And then on Thursday the 5th, Chris Vermeulen from the Technical Traders, one of the best at educating and empowering traders to uh, embrace technical methods into their process. So make sure you check out those three interviews next week. Let's continue on with our Wrap the Week segment. Let's focus on how the markets have evolved. We have a lot to talk about today. Given the deterioration this week, we're going to try to put this week into proper perspective and help you prepare for next week, Fed meeting, more earnings, and much more. I want to start with a poll. We asked you recently on our live stream page at stockcharts.com slash TV, also on our social media account. So make sure you follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you're up to date with these uh, questions we pose. We asked you recently, which of these would you rather own over the next three months? Consumer discretionary, which only got 7% of the vote, which I could totally see that being pretty light. Number two, consumer staples, which got a third of you to respond, which means 60% of you said cash. That tells you a lot about this market environment as we asked it over the last couple of days, given the option to own consumer discretionary, which has been one of the better long-term stories in recent years. Consumer staples, which overall has emerged in uh, in a position of strength, outperformance from things like tobacco stocks. At some point, I was looking with uh, Grayson Rose at food products earlier today uh, with some with some strength. 60% of you said cash. I didn't vote there. I probably would have said consumer staples only because I think you have the limited upside in cash. And cash, you're basically guaranteed a zero. If you go into uh, consumer staples, you have the opportunity to uh, outperform uh, the S&P by owning names like Coke and others. Uh, and again, uh, you know, from a technical perspective, the chart of Coke doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's a strong chart. Uh, pulled back a little bit. It reminds me of charts like Valero, right, that have uh, that jumped up a little bit. These are obviously choppy uh, times and choppy charts. However, 
the net result of all of this uncertainty is uh, is strength in some of these particular areas of the market. So uh, focusing on risk and thinking about when to opportunistically raise cash makes a ton of sense. The good news, and, and I would say the good news about having cash, or what we would always call it raising cash uh, in the uh, institutional environment, right? If you're running, running a multi-billion dollar fund, you know, if the market goes down, you really can't re-engage, you really can't buy more of anything if you haven't raised cash when things are uh, when things are going well or when things are starting to deteriorate. So the good news about raising cash uh, in a week like this is if and when the NASDAQ eventually bottoms out, which has not happened yet today, by the way, you'll have the opportunity, you'll have cash available to re uh, you know, to re-deploy uh, into the market. So good to think about that in terms of your cash balance and how you change that uh, given the environment. So I agree with the 60% of you that said cash, although I could see the argument for consumer staples as well. Let's look at the damage together uh, today. And, you know, I've asked sometimes when the market's going down, uh, how I'm smiling in the introduction and everything. I tend to be pretty happy in any environment, but I was watching the CMT symposium from uh, Washington DC earlier today. And shout out to our friends, at the CMT uh, Association, uh, you know, holding their uh, annual symposium uh, yesterday and today, and uh, Jay Woods, who's been on our uh, on our show and on our channel before, uh, was commenting on uh, this sort of uh, th this sort of uh, environment. And and basically, when you have this sort of uh, this have this sort of deterioration, it's all about putting things into proper perspective. It's all about thinking about uh, how these moves have uh, have evolved over time and what today means relative to. Uh, the big picture. So, um, it, but it should not be an emotional reaction, right? It's all about thinking of the market academically, you know, thinking about reward and risk, but not having it be an emotional thing, right? You shouldn't feel bad that the market's down, just like you should not feel elated when the market's up. If you are, if you find yourself having those emotional reactions, you're, you're probably your position size is too big because your emotional. Uh, you know, strength or weakness on any given day is tied too much to the movements of the market. You want to disconnect from that as much as you can, because usually that motivates bad decisions, not good decisions. But let's look at the damage this week. The uh, today, the S and P down three point six percent, well below that forty two hundred, nearing actually forty one hundred. Nasdaq one hundred down almost four and a half percent today, which obviously is a pretty big, uh, pretty big hit. Gave back all of yesterday's bounce and more. Here's a little two day preview chart. Of the Nasdaq composite. And that's why yesterday, when you see those big, you know, two, three percent plus gains, it's very easy to feel very optimistic on a bounce. However, as we talked about yesterday, the S and P, it makes sense. The Nasdaq it makes sense after a big deterioration to have a nice bounce. But think about how much ground you're really gaining. And again, one bad day today wiped out all of the that uh, that happiness that you saw in the market yesterday. The VIX well back above thirty, spiking higher given the deterioration. In price interest rates pushing higher, and I alluded to Jeff Hughes yesterday on the show giving his six percent outlook over the next couple of years for ten-year yields. Talk about a dramatically different environment. Dollar index down uh, about a sorry 0.4 percent using the UUP. Gold flat for the day, uh, but really that came uh, in the last hour. Had been up pretty decently, but commodities in general rolled over going into the uh, into the close. Silver uh, as well in the broader commodity complex, uh, the same. Very much a risk-off move across the table. Bitcoin, uh, Ether price is down as well. B Ether now below 2,800. Bitcoin uh, just above 38,000, well below uh, levels in the low 40s that we'd seen not too long ago. Let's look at how this week evolved, and then we'll touch on uh, some of the other uh, other key things. And just as, a, as one quick point, I just wanted to mention what outperformed today, materials and energy, but both of those down two, two and a half percent. Healthcare was right after that, around two and a half percent. The real weakness was in tech in real estate and consumer discretionary, all down over 4% today. Let's take a look here at the wrap the week chart. So what we like to do is just look at the uh, last five trading days. We start the clock last Friday and let's see what happened. Uh, the S&P finishing the week down uh, about 3%. Now it was up on the week yesterday on the close, given the rally, gave all, about, all of that back and more. So finishing the week down over 3%. A couple of things underperformed. Here's Bitcoin down 3.3%. Since last Friday in pink, we have the NASDAQ 100 down 3.7%. In purple, we have small cap stocks. The Russell 2000 down almost 4%. Everything else actually outperformed the S&P. Gold was down 1.9%. In red, we have uh, the TLT. Bond price is down half a percent. In orange, emerging markets essentially flat for the week. A couple of things actually were net positive. Crude oil prices using the USO was up 1.1%. The dollar index, the best performer, up 1.9%. And when I'm seeing these movements, I'm seeing how bonds 
are uh, coming off a bit going into uh, into the weekend. I'm seeing how crude oil is performing okay. The dollar index is up. I'm immediately going back to uh, Jesse uh, Felder, who was on the show last week. And I'd encourage you to go back to that interview on stockchartstv.com. He had a fantastic chart looking at crude oil prices, the dollar uh, bonds going higher uh, and, uh, and interest rates going higher, excuse me, and then how that lines up with recessions or, or pullbacks in earnings. Uh, a really interesting chart. If you missed it, go back and hear uh, Jesse's comments on, uh, on that show. We'll finish off here and look at the Mindful Investor live chart list. This is a, a list of charts that I keep updated on stockcharts.com. Uh, my market trend model has been bearish on the medium term and short term, certainly uh, continuing that. Uh, two weeks ago, we turned negative on both sides and uh, continue to be negative as of Friday's close today. My long-term model is dangerously close to going negative. It has not been negative very often, just a handful of times since the 2009 market low. If we would break below the zero level, that would put this current pullback in a similar vein to, uh, to 2020 to late 2018, which are the two most significant pullbacks that we've seen since 2015, 2016, and then going back to 2000, uh, uh, 2009. Um, I would not be surprised to see that uh, indicator go negative, given the, again the, given the broad deterioration and the clear downtrends that we're seeing, has not happened yet. The S and P obviously a pretty painful week, and as I composite as well, we are in that range of the uh, of the lows. We've now undercut the March lows, and are now testing the lows uh, from late February. Worth noting on a closing basis, as of today, we have made a new closing low. For the year, so while we're uh, you know attempting to make a new intraday low, today's close just above forty one thirty. Now a new closing low for two thousand twenty two. And again, we've talked about the danger signs that have been emerging, really starting in November, going into December, January. It's when we started to see breadth of deterioration. Then we start to see price deterioration. Now finally, we're seeing uh, you know while a number of things have already broken down through support, the S and P now finally starting to undercut some key support levels. Looking at measures of breadth, now these are not updated yet through today's close on Friday the 29th. Uh, however, uh, two of the four cumulative advanced decline lines have already undercut their March lows. The mid cap advanced decline line is very close to doing so, may have done so today. The large cap AD line still has not done so, and that's an important chart to, uh, to watch. We covered sentiment uh, yesterday quite a bit, including the AAII survey. And if you want to dig more into sentiment, I just posted a video to my YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior, digging into the AAII survey, looking at the last 25 years of that indicator and where we're at right now relative, where, relative to where we've been. We're in unprecedented levels of, uh, of bearish sentiment uh, using that survey data. And I encourage you to check that out on my YouTube channel. Less than 50% of uh, S&P members above their 200-day moving average, less than 50% above their 50-day uh, as well. Um, and so I would encourage you to watch these. These remain below 50%. This is bear market activity. They finally get back above 50%. That tells you a recovery may be mounting, but we're certainly not seeing, uh, seeing it yet. Just to finish off here, bullish percent index is back to below 50%, which is a, uh, a concerning pattern. We're now within uh, or similar to some of the previous observations where we broke below it. You know, it's interesting, the last couple of times we've been below 50%, we've stayed below there at least a week, and they've been bounces overall, but still within a uh, what I would call a cyclical bear market. And I think the fact that we're making a, a new low uh, today for the year, a new closing low, I would argue confirms that we're now in a cyclical uh, bear market phase. Uh, that long-term trend model turning negative would, uh, would all but confirm that uh, for certain. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my next uh, segment, powering up your use of the Stock Charts platform. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close, particularly in uncertain times. We can help you navigate these markets and, uh, and help focus on some of the key charts to pay attention to. A couple quick announcements before we get to my next segment. First off, 
We welcome your questions. A little later in today's show, we're going to answer your questions from the Final Bar mailbag. You can get your questions to us via email, which is the best way, the Final Bar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. Hope to hear from you in one of those places, and we'll answer your question in our next mailbag segment Tuesday of next week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. Special events like The Pitch, our Stock Charts Draft, which aired uh, earlier this week. So much great uh, conversations with guests like Katie Stockton, Jay Woods, Jesse Felder, and many, many others, all for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to continue on with our next segment, Power Up. What we like to do about once a week is help you power up your use of the Stock Charts platform, upgrade your own use of our, uh, of our fantastic system. We find so many users don't use enough of this platform because there's a rich uh, resource of market history, of market uh, analytics and, uh, and techniques for you to use. What I wanted to share with you is one of the uh, releases or one of the, the uh, features in our most recent product released a couple of weeks ago. We released a new version of stockcharts.com uh, and a number of different features on there. I'll show you in a minute where you can see all of the new features, but I just wanted to highlight for you one little one in the, uh, in the ACP platform, which we don't feature probably enough on this, uh, on this uh, show, but uh, it's a really uh, obviously an incredibly powerful uh, dynamic platform uh, two upgrades that I wanted to share with you. First off, if you're looking at a uh, an individual stock, you can click on the price. We're going to click on where it says, uh, the little legend says Apple Daily. That's the closing price. This is where you can adjust all the different uh, visual parts of this uh, technique. You can add earnings dates and dividends as little icons onto your uh, onto your screen. Traditionally, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this incredibly uh, powerful relationship between short-term price movements and earnings dates. And if you look at a chart of any stock, you'll most likely see a gap every three months or so. And that's usually related to earnings. Stocks have a tendency to move very quickly overnight because you have earn, uh, earnings uh, after the bell, uh, before the opening bell. And as a result, there's a quick revaluation of the stock as investors digest whatever new information you might have gotten from, uh, from earnings. So if you're trying to understand that relationship between price, the dividends that a company is paying out, and also their earnings and so how they're how they're reinvesting their capital into growing the company and or redistributing that to uh, investors. You can add those as uh, little icons. I also want to point out if you use the annotations on this uh, the ACP platform, they've all gotten a fantastic upgrade. One I wanted to highlight for you is just the Fibonacci retracement. So if you uh, go to apply the Fibonacci retracements, you'll see you have a lot more uh, flexibility than you did before in terms of the shading, in terms of the width of the lines, the colors of the lines that you're using, uh, the labels, how many uh, uh, particular support and resistance levels you want to add. So we traditionally only had a couple for you. We've added a whole series that allows you to use this uh, Fibonacci tool to literally project further support and resistance. You can actually use it as a uh, Fibonacci um, projection tool and look at not just 100% of the move, but 138, 162, 200, and, uh, and so forth. And you can add all these different uh, options, change the colors, the, uh, the ways that it's represented on your chart. So two nice recent upgrades on the ACP platform, adding earnings dates as a little icons onto your screen, upgrading the annotations. I just showed you Fibonacci retracements. There's a lot more. You can at any time go to stockcharts.com slash new to see all of our uh, additions to the platform. We have an article just recently posted on the Alki release, which is our most recent product release, and it'll list out for you all the different new features onto the Stock Charts platform. Let's continue on with our next segment, the final bar mailbag. Keep your questions coming to us via email, and let's get to question number one. I like to use the Stock Charts scanner to look for new opportunities uh, to add to an equal weight trend following portfolio. I liked PPL.to, which is a Canadian listing, but when I compare it to the XLE, I'm not sure what to make of it. Is it indicating to look for better tickers or that this market is starting to look attractive? Uh, now, uh, to be clear, you sent me this question about a week ago. So sorry, I'm just getting to it uh, now. But I hit on a number of, uh, number of things here. What's very interesting to me, by the way, is uh, you sent this chart. Thanks for sending a a link to the chart. By the way, when you're asking questions, click on permalink and send me the link that you uh, that comes up there because that'll allow me to actually bring up the live chart that you're asking about. This annotation that you put on here, this is when you sent the question, you're looking at that as a breakout level. Look at how beautifully P 
PPL actually came down. This is a pipeline company uh, based in Canada. So yeah, pull right back down to that 48 level you'd, uh, you'd identified. Nice hammer candle and now bouncing above there. I think holding 48 is certainly uh, an interesting uh, thing to pay attention to. You're asking about this series on the bottom though, I believe, which is looking at this particular stock, Pembina Pipeline Company versus the XLE. So here we're looking at uh, PPL relative to the S&P 500, which clearly it's been outperforming. But here, when you look at PPL versus XLE, sort of downtrend now sideways and now potentially starting to uh, to roll up a little bit. What you have to remember is these sort of relative ratios are all about telling you what a particular stock is doing versus other things. And so most commonly, we do it relative to a benchmark because uh, you know, as an investor, you could either, if you think about this way, I could either just park all my assets in the spiders, or I could start making some active bets and own individual names or ETFs to help me outperform ideally. So this line going up means you're outperforming a passive benchmark. This line is all about the answering the question, am I owning the right energy stock? So if you buy into the idea that energy is going to outperform, that oil prices are going higher, which I would argue probably still a decent bet. Greg Schnell will back me up on this one, one of our fellow contributors who often uh, speaks of the, uh, the long-term potential for energy stocks and materials as well. Uh, but I think this chart tells you whether you're owning the right energy stock, right? If this line is going higher, that means not just is PPL outperforming the market, it's actually outperforming other energy stocks. That's why that ratio is so helpful. I have a chart style uh, called Gaddis because Gaddis Rose shared this with me a while ago. Uh, let me bring up a, a U.S. stock. That's, this one's actually tied to U.S. Uh, U.S. metrics. So here we're actually looking at AT&T versus the broad market. AT&T's uh, sector versus the broad market, AT&T's group versus the sector, and AT&T versus its group. So you can look at all of these different combinations. And if you analyze each of these lines, it tells you whether you're in a leading sector, whether you're in a leading group within a leading sector, and whether you're in a leading stock within a leading group. And that's what these ratios are all meant to do. Question number two, Newmont Mining NEM has been supported at the 20-day moving average for about a month. And now it's closed below its 60-day moving average. RSI has gone below 50. Similar situation for a number of other names, FCX, AG, and other strong metals performers. How do you interpret this? Is this a sell signal and signaling dip or a longer-term downturn? I think that's a really good question. This is something, uh, one of my three and three charts is actually the GDX, which is a uh, you know a gold bugs index uh, with uh, Newmont mining type names in there. I think the performance in gold has been uh, has been a tough rise here, or a tough tough ride. In late March, early April, felt pretty clear that these stocks were doing very well. Gold prices going higher, which makes sense because in an inflationary environment, usually investors will go to the relative safely of safety of gold and gold stocks because they tend to ride out. They tend to be sort of a good ways to ride out uh, inflationary uh, or, or uh, strong inflationary uh, periods where a lot of other stocks are starting to uh, struggle a little bit. In the last week, and really last week is when you saw this broad distribution. From there, you're starting to see some stabilization. I don't like the fact that Newmont is below its 50-day moving average. You mentioned the 60-day. I tend to use the 50-day uh, more often. I would much rather own stocks that are above an upward sloping 50-day moving average than below it. So uh, Newmont Mining and other names like it, getting back above the 50-day, I think, would be, uh, would be pretty encouraging. The fact that these stocks are not able to hold support would be damning evidence. And so I would be focusing on that 71 level, which is the low from March as well. I was talking with Grayson Rose earlier today. We were looking at Freeport McMoran, uh, same sector, different group. This is more of a, of a uh, you know, non-ferrous metals, more copper and other things, but pulling back to the 200 day moving average. I think these stocks are very close to breaking down here. And if they do get below those key support levels, I would certainly be looking for opportunities elsewhere. Next question, could moderately higher yields cause a stronger U.S. dollar resulting in a melt-up of U.S. stocks and bonds? Uh, there's so much embedded in a very brief and well-worded question, and I appreciate it so much. I wanted to share with you this chart, uh, which is an adaptation of the chart that Jesse Felder shared uh, last week. I mentioned uh, his, uh, his appearance because he was talking about this relationship, and this is essentially the chart that he shared uh, during his interview. Here's the gap earnings for the S&P 500. So it's basically a monthly chart of how the S&P companies are earning. Are they growing earnings or shrinking earnings at any period? And these pink arrows highlight when the trend in earnings has been going down over the last 25 years. Look at this combination where before earnings have deteriorated, you've tended to see all three of these things occur. Higher interest rates, stronger crude oil prices, stronger dollar. You've seen that in the last couple of times and really every major time going back to the late 90s, 
and you're seeing it now over the last couple, um, you know, last year, you're seeing stronger interest rates, stronger crude oil prices, stronger dollar. And what that would most likely allude to is the fact that earnings are probably going to be uh, rolling over here. But there tends to be a gap. You can see, uh, you know, all of these were moving higher really into late 2019 before earnings started to come down in 2020. So this could be more of a broader indication of weakness to come in, uh, in equity earnings. And usually if earnings are coming down, the stocks are struggling. You can think of the chart of the S&P and you know that those are really the four major pullbacks that we've seen uh, since the uh, since the March 2000 or, or including the March uh, 2000, uh, 2000 high. So overall, I would say, yes, I think your question really alludes to what uh, Jesse Felder was pointing out. I think uh, I, I have to agree with that historical pattern. You're seeing those uh, lines. My only comment would be, remember, this is a long-term chart. This is a monthly chart. So there can be some career busting moves over time until uh, earnings would start to roll over until this uh, this uh, pattern may actually emerge as uh, as he was talking about. Finally, one last question. BPENER, which is the bullish percent index for the energy sector, fell 53% a few days ago while XLE lost much less. Is this due to weighting and market cap of XLE's components? Should we anticipate lower XLE because of a 53% drop in its bullish percent index? By the way, if you go to our market summary page, we have tickers for all the major uh, sectors, also uh, indexes and a number of industry groups with their bullish percent indexes. What you're referring to is the fact that the bullish percent index went from 100% a couple of weeks ago to all of a sudden down to almost 30%. What happened was a lot of those charts like Valero and others uh, that have been very, very strong rolled over just enough here in the last week. That pullback was just enough to trigger sell signals from the point and figure charts. Mo many of them, if not all of them, have now started to rotate higher. Not, not all of them, as you can see from uh, the uh, bullish percent index that is still below 50%. But if you continue to see this move higher, these stocks will have to regain their previous highs. Valero is one of the better performers. A lot of the energy stocks within the S&P still have a little further improvement to go. Uh, but I would say, yes, it represents, I think, the, the pullback that you saw broader in the market, particularly in the energy sector. At the end of the day, I would still be focusing on relative strength on these names. And I think that's where they certainly continue to impress. There's no relative component to bullish percent. It is straight looking at the uh, price action. We need to wrap this show and wrap this week on the final bar. So many charts to talk about. We're only able to show some of them, but let's talk about three key ones to pay attention to over this weekend. Chart number one is my fan mag chart, and I've reordered the six fan mag stocks in order of uh, grouping them uh, basically by uh, their patterns. The first off, we have the strongest charts uh, and really the strongest uh, that have been, I think have been the strongest for quite some time, Apple, and then Microsoft, what concerns me is the two strongest stocks out of these six have also both gone now below their 200-day moving average. Apple was the lone holdout, not closing below its 200-day moving average, just did it again today. I want to see, obviously, next week if you get further follow-through to the downside. But overall, that's a stock now in uh, in danger, testing support. I think uh, Microsoft as well, testing support in that 270, 280 range. So those are the strongest stocks, but at the lower end of the range, threatening to break down. The next two have now broken down through support. So while Apple and Microsoft are testing these support levels from earlier in this uh, year, Alphabet and now Amazon have very strongly broken down through support and now in a, uh, a bit of a free fall. Meta platforms gapping higher on earnings, but overall still well below the, the, uh, the previous swing high. So a lot of uh, ground to be made up to be more constructive here. Netflix obviously continuing to push and making a new swing low uh, this week. So it's hard to imagine the market, markets as a whole doing well, our growth-oriented benchmarks without these charts, finding support and rotating higher, and we're not seeing it yet. Chart number two is the NASDAQ composite. We've talked about the major indexes, again, making a new closing low for the year, but I'm more interested in this relative strength of the NASDAQ composite versus the S&P. Here's your quick history lesson. The NASDAQ composite underperformed in the first to second quarter of 2021, then it pretty much was the market until November. And when I talk about the market topping out in November, I'm thinking of this chart, which was the high in uh, in the NASDAQ composite. Look at that consistent string of relative underperformance from those November highs. Finally, finally gold stocks. We talked about Newmont Mining, we talked about Freeport Macaron. I'm surprised a bit that gold stocks are not doing better. But again, that's a great reminder to not focus on what should work, focus on what is working. Gold stocks are struggling to hold support right now. I'd like to see GDX and New Montanithers regain their 50-day moving average. Folks, that is a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. 
every weekday after the close for our show, StockChartsTV.com for all of our previous episodes and interviews. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you next week. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.